Many people agreed that the North American Free Trade Agreement needed an update. Then President Donald Trump took that to a whole new level. It's been a wild few months as Mexico and the U.S. hammered out their version of the agreement. Now it's Canada's turn in the pressure cooker that is renegotiating a multi-billion dollar trade deal. Joining us now on the ups, the downs, and sometimes sideways of the NAFTA talks, in the American capital via Skype, Inu Monik. She is visiting scholar at the Cato Institute. In our nation's capital, Craig Alexander, partner and chief economist at Deloitte Canada. And here in our studio, Mark Warner, principal, Canadian and American trade lawyer at Ma Law. And Jim Stanford, the Harold Innes industry professor in economics at McMaster University and honorary professor of political economy at the University of Sydney in Australia. Jim, always delighted to welcome hey, you back Steve. to these parts. Welcome Thank back you. to Moz. Mark, good Thank to see you, you again. Much. Craig in Ottawa, Inu, first time on the program where we're glad to have you here. So let's put you to work right away, uh, helping us understand uh, some of the intricacies of these negotiations. And I want to start with something that's been very topical lately. That is, we hear a lot of talk about the so-called Chapter 19 of NAFTA and why it's so crucial to the resumption of these talks. Help us understand, what is Chapter 19? Right, so Canadians are very familiar with the softwood lumber dispute and the fact that that dispute re resulted in uh, anti-dumping and countervailing duties being imposed uh, by U.S. agencies. Now, normally what happens uh, when such duties are imposed is that companies can basically come to a U.S. domestic court and appeal that agency decision. Uh, what Chapter 19 does is sets up a special appeals process uh, that is an ad hoc panel that can then basically act just like the Court of International Trade in the United States by reviewing the agency's interpretation and application of U.S. law. And that's exactly what Chapter 19 does right now. And in your view, does it work? Well, in the 80s, when this was first thought up, there were specific problems with the Court of International Trade. For one, they took too long to, uh, to work out cases. Uh, there was some evidence that they were biased against foreigners uh, and that they were not have, didn't have enough expertise on trade matters. But largely, that's been resolved. And what we've seen with Chapter 19 is, though it may have been successful in the early years, we still have a softwood lumber problem, and we still have not solved that. And so overall, I would say that Chapter 19 hasn't worked uh, for Canada, and, and therefore it's not really the hill it wants to die on in these negotiations. Hmm. Mark, uh, w we certainly hear that Canada is digging in its heels and wants Chapter 19 to stay. In your view, does it work? I think that, <clears throat> that going back just a little bit earlier than when Inu started with, uh, we put this in the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, that was in 1987-88, so it's before we had a stronger dispute settlement system in the WTO, which came on board in 1995. World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization. So if you were sitting back, if you could sort of take the time machine back to 1987, you would definitely want Chapter 19 because you had nowhere else to go. Hmm. Now, even though Trump makes noises about w the WTO dispute settlement system, the Americans continue to play in that system in terms of responding to disputes and that sort of thing. So the question is, what does Chapter 19 give us now? that uh, now that we have that WTO settlement system, and I don't think it gives us very much. In other words, why, what are we trading for? We're trading for something that we know on softwood lumber, the big case uh, that Inu mentioned, the U.S. really hasn't really followed what they've been told to do in Chapter 19. There are outstanding questions about its constitutionality in the United States, mm -hmm. and every time we get a, a ruling like softwood lumber, you know, lawyers such as myself will go running off into the court saying it's unconstitutional, and then Canada will have to find some other settlement. So I guess the question is, what is it really worth to us? Um, it's worth a lot to the people who negotiated it, with all due respect to them. It was a singular achievement in 1987, and I think there's an awful lot of pride of authorship around it. Well, let's get Craig Alexander to weigh in on this. Is this something that you think the Trudeau government ought to be digging its feet in on? I think, I think Chapter 19 is, in fact, something worth fighting for. I'm not sure I'd be willing to sacrifice NAFTA over it, but at the end of the day, the, the issue is really the having the option to take a trade dispute to an independent ar arbitrator uh, to get to get a resolution. Um, yes, you know there are other options. You know the U.S. Inter you, you can go to the U.S. court system, and you know we have seen that in recent years that has worked perfectly fine. Uh, but there's no guarantee that the tide won't shift, and we couldn't see the U.S. court <clears throat> court system go back to being biased. So you can go to the WTO, but the arbitration process, you know, in theory, should be faster. So it, I think it's a useful tool, but I, I don't think I'd be willing necessarily to sacrifice NAFTA over. Jim, what's your view? 
Well, Steve, I don't think we should be under any illusions that the U.S. government, whether it was Trump in charge or somebody else, is ever going to be totally held to account by some kind of neutral international body. That just isn't the reality of how trade politics work. So I think it was naive in the first place in 87 when the Canadians went in, and this was what it was all about. Uh, Mulroney, Prime Minister Mulroney at the time, promised, we will get exemption from U.S. trade actions if we join this free trade deal. That's why we gave up our energy and all the other things we gave up in that agreement. Uh, and it never, it never really worked. But it won't really work with the WTO either. Someone like Trump or someone who comes after Trump can equally <laughs> uh, thumb their nose at those trade rules and say, no, I'm going to come down for usually political reasons on the side of some American constituency that we want to protect. So the idea that there will ever be a neutral trade rule system that can hold people like Trump to account, I think, is naive. Chapter 19 hasn't lived up to it, but neither has the WTO, frankly. Okay. Well, you've got the floor. I want to stick right. with you because you're the car guy here. Oh, boy. You spent many, many years <laughs> as the economist for the mm -hmm. Canadian auto workers. And one of, the things that we, one of the things that we have seen now is that the United States wants to increase the percentage of cars that must be made from North American sources. Yes. I gather the figure is currently 62.5%. The United States has proposed raising that to 85%. What impact would that have on Canada? I think potentially, if it was part of a balanced three-way deal, it could be very beneficial for the Canadian industry. It means you're getting more North American content in all of the vehicles that are made, whether it's in Mexico, U.S., or Canada, where the final assembly occurs. It means more of the steel and the aluminum and the electronics and the parts and the powertrain will be made in North America. And I think that they've made some progress towards lifting that overall level and also trying to ensure that it doesn't all go to Mexico. This was part of the U.S.-Mexico talks that were occurring, was to make sure that, you know, the low wages uh, that are paid in Mexico because of the, the obviously the poverty there and the, and the lack of free trade unions doesn't suck all the investment down there. So just, potentially should, that could be beneficial. We should just get a little more specific on that. I gathered President Trump wants a provision in the new agreement that says you've got to pay your workers 16 bucks an hour U.S. or else you can't be part of the agreement. Is that what, sort of it? I think, as I understand it, and of course it's not public so we don't see the details, it would be a certain proportion of the car has to be made by people who are making at least $16 an hour. That Which seems proposal, to take aim in Mexico, obviously. Exactly. That hmm. proposal actually originally came from the two auto unions in Canada and the United States. Unifor and the United Auto hmm. Workers were putting forward that idea, and in fact it got taken up in the discussions. Um, it is, in a way, a, a way to make sure that the whole industry doesn't flow south to Mexico for labor cost reasons uh, alone. And that combined with some of the other measures, such as strengthening requirements on Mexico to allow free trade unionism, which isn't the case today, those, I think, could ensure that the overall North American industry remains more balanced across the three countries rather than migrating south, as has been the case. Let's go back to Washington. Inu, where are you on what's happening with the car aspect of NAFTA right now? Well, I think that it's potentially quite problematic, actually, to increase the rule of origin content requirement for autos. Because if you look at NAFTA rules of origin, they're already some of the most stringent of any trade agreement in the world. Uh, and the problem is, is that increasing North American content kind of uh, works counterproductively to the way that global supply chains now work today. There's a lot of inputs that we get from Europe, from Asia, uh, and that's going to push those out a bit. The current requirements that put, were put forward of 75 percent uh, on North American uh, auto requirement, uh, Mexico would probably meet about 70 percent of that. Uh, but 30 percent then would face the 2.5 percent MFN tariff. That's the most favored nation tariff that basically all countries that don't have a trade agreement with the United States have to pay. So that's going to be a tax on those additional autos. And I think that's going to be a major problem. Mark, let's just play this out. President Trump came into office pledging to do something for the, for example, auto workers in the United States who have lost their jobs because they were making, whatever, 25, 30 bucks an hour compared to the folks in Mexico making three bucks an hour. And obviously... The jobs went there. Can NAFTA address that? Well, it can't completely. But part of what's going to end up happening is, is companies are either going to make a decision whether they're going to go along with uh, these rules of origin or whether they'll pay, as Inu said, the, um, the, the MFN tariff. The tw uh, uh, and then the other thing is Trump has also threatened this 25% national security tariff on, uh, on autos. He hasn't done it yet. He has the authority to do it. He hasn't done it. Um, and I guess the question would be if... if Trump were to see that it, the production patterns don't change, would he on new production 
um, hammer them with that 25% tariff. He's leaving so far in terms of the U.S. Mexico piece, he's left himself that option. But you know, on the margins, it'll probably what it's going to end up is leading to more automation in Mexico, fewer Mexican workers. But I'm not sure it's going to change the fundamental pattern of sourcing. Uh, products uh, in uh, uh, parts in Mexico. Craig, we don't know if this story is actually true. It may be apocryphal, but uh, President Trump said it the other day. He said whenever negotiations get sticky with Canada, he just holds up a picture of a Chevy Impala uh, as if to say, you better watch out. The Impala, of course, made in Oshawa. And if you don't do what we like, we're going to put a 25% tariff on this thing, and then, then we'll see how many you sell. What kind of an impact is, uh, is the car thing having right now on trying to get NAFTA to the finish line? Well, autos, <clears throat> autos are, are a key part of the discussions. And, you know, from a Canadian economy point of view, um, you know, the, the risk of having a 25% tariff put on, on Canadian auto shipments to the United States and, say, a 10% tariff on, on parts would be really significant. It would, it would lower economic growth in Canada by probably half a percentage point. But because of the concentration of the auto sector in Ontario, it could actually knock about two points off of Ontario's economic growth and that likely would actually lead to a mild recession in, in, in Ontario. So when President Trump makes the, the threat of applying tariffs on, on autos, you know, he is making a, a threat that, that would carry an e e economic harm. Um, but the, the challenge is that it would also hurt America uh, very significantly because we really do have North American supply chains. Um, parts that go into creating a final vehicle cross the border many times. And as a consequence, you know, the tariffs would hurt Canada, but they would also hurt the U.S. automakers very severely. And I think that that, in a sense, you know, waters down the threat. You know, so it is it is a credible threat, but it's also one that you need to keep in perspective in terms of, you know, how, how would Congress feel about these tariffs being applied on on Canadian vehicles that are part of a North American supply chain that would hurt U.S. producers in a very significant way as well. Steve, let me jump in on the story of the Impala, which is kind of interesting. I think Krista Freeland should hold up a picture of an F-150 pickup truck and a big GMC sport utility, because the reality is, on, in addition to the supply chain effect that Craig just mentioned, the Americans sell a huge amount of vehicles back in Canada. And what do they think is going to happen if they put a 25% tariff on vehicles from us? Clearly, the reverse is going to happen from Canada as well. You, so you think can the Canadian government would, would put tariffs on the American well, product. Well, that's been their response so far right. to all of other, all of Trump's other unilateral things. So there's, we obviously cannot stop the Americans from cutting off their nose to spite their face if that's what the, where the president wants to go. But in economic terms, there's no logic for the Americans to do that. It is about pre-bargaining threats uh, from Trump. Yeah, I think this is where we have to be very careful in Canada about this. In the past, when we've had trade disputes with the United States, we've dealt with a with an American architecture, a trade architecture that has a relatively free trading <laughs> president and a relatively protectionist Congress. Mm -hmm. And so the strategy has been line up the domestic constituencies in the United States and Congress will act. The, Trump is a former CEO, he ran his own company. The one piece of place where he can actually use his full executive authority is something like those national security tariffs. Mm -hmm. So all of this talk about Congress stepping in to help us, what it would take, Steve, in reality, is a veto-proof majority in two houses of Congress. That's not going that to happen. That doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. And, and I think this is what Canadians need to keep in mind. Trump has that power. So if we're negotiating with the United States with the idea, oh, it's just a pre-negotiation threat, we're going to show them pictures and tit-for-tat uh, you know, threats are going to make them come to the table, that might come to the table if you were dealing with the congressperson from Michigan. Hmm. You might come to the table if you're dealing with someone from Indiana. The audience we have is an audience of one. And it's Donald Trump. And that's been, I think, the problem in the Canadian approach to these negotiations across the board, is they've tried to do these end runs around him, as opposed to realizing that, that he has it, and as we saw in steel and aluminum, is prepared to use it. And so that's why we can't over bargain for things like chapter 19 or dairy or culture, because I think that he's the kind of guy who's shown us that he's prepared to use the power that he has. Well, let me pick up on that. And you mentioned the, the steel and aluminum tariffs, which uh, Mr. Trump has already uh, moved on. Inu, I'll bring you back in at this point. Uh, there have been plenty of American uh, stakeholders in the United States who are significant players in the economy, who have constantly reminded this president that every time he puts a tariff on somebody else, the somebody else tends to put one back on America, and at the end of the day, it's worse for the American economy. He seems not to be perturbed by that. It seems not to be a factor in his decision making. Why do you think? Um, why do you think that is? 
I'm not quite sure why exactly that's the case. I think there's been a lot of pushback from U.S. industry, especially uh, on the imposition of the steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is a specific interest uh, that he's trying to serve, and, and that's what he's carved this out for. Uh, so at the end of the day, we, we really can't do anything about these uh, 232 tariffs uh, rather than take a challenge to the WTO and, and hope that that prevails. But in the meantime, what we can do is sit down and negotiate and hope that he'll lift those uh, tariffs as well as part of that negotiating process. I know Minister Freeland has said that it's a separate process, but I think he really sees this as leverage uh, in, in this bargaining and the negotiation process in NAFTA. Let me get you to follow up with this, because, uh, of course, in this country, the conventional wisdom is we in Canada need this deal far more than you in the United States need the deal. And if the president gets super tough during negotiations, we may just have to bite the bullet in order to get something at the end of the day. Do you agree with that analysis, that at the end of the day, Canada is going to have to sacrifice more to get a deal than the Americans will because we need it more? I don't think it's necessarily true that Canada needs it more than the United States. In fact, uh, both countries have a reciprocal trade relationship, integrated supply chains, uh, and an integrated North American market that they're part of. So I think, uh, you know, getting rid of NAFTA would be the equivalent of the U.S. shooting itself in the foot. It's not going to be good for the United States. I think this is exactly why a number of members of Congress have basically said and come out and said that they will not support a bilateral NAFTA agreement that doesn't have Canada in it. So they want a trilateral deal. And I think Congress really will push hard uh, on making this happen uh, as much as they can. So I think Canada will have to give something, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't have to give everything in this negotiation. So Mark? there's two steps to this, just piggyback off my previous comments. Um, there's two separate issues. One issue is can Trump get a new NAFTA, a revised NAFTA, bilateral, or you know, one alone with Mexico through? And yes, Congress could have a lot to say on that. The threat, and Trump gets his threat. I mean, he gets what his authority is. He has two places where he can counter that. One is he can use his executive authority to withdraw from NAFTA. Now, that will lead to a lot of litigation, and lawyers will debate it. The general view, the better view, I think, among American lawyers, is he has that authority, certainly to terminate, to give notice to Canada and Mexico. And then what happens to the existing NAFTA? That's his threat. His other threat is what we talked about is the threat to go forward with those Section 232 tariffs. And either one of those cases would require the House and the Senate basically countermanding him. So yes, the votes are there perhaps to stop him from revising NAFTA. But if he gets angry and says, well, you're not revising NAFTA along the ways I like, so I'm just going to get rid of what's there now. And he's shown us that capriciousness. Yeah. This is why I, I get a little bit concerned that we, we push back a little bit too hard in Canada and think that all of these congressional people are going to ride to the rescue. And unless we can be certain that they can ride to the rescue in a veto-proof majority, um, this is, these are some very high bets we're making. Well, Craig, I, I, I got to bring you in at this point. And, and you know that in Canada, uh, I, I, at least most of the voices I hear in Canada quoted on this say the president's being a bully against Canada. Uh, number one, do you agree with that? And number two, if you do, what are we supposed to do about it? Well, I, I think that Trump is trying to bargain for the best deal he can get with the most advantage for America. And it's coming across as, as, as bullying. But you can understand what the intent is. Um, but I would argue that, you know, while there is this threat that he could put tariffs on Canadian, the Canadian auto sector on sort of a national securities ground, because he's using, you know, just as he, just with steel, he's using a, an aluminum, he's using a sort of WTO loophole to be able to apply these, these tariffs. Because clearly, you know, Canadian auto exports to the United States do not pose a national security threat. But at the same time, while we have to be mindful that, that he does have the capacity to put those very painful and e economically harmful tariffs on Canadian autos, let's remember that we're actually negotiating a NAFTA that has to survive, or we want to, to basically be a new deal that's going to last for decades. You know, it's going to be, it, we're trying to renegotiate a NAFTA that we're going to live with long, long after his term is over. And if Canada gives up a lot at the, at the bargaining table now, it, it could be very hard to actually make modifications afterwards after Trump has gone. So, you know, it is important for Canada in, at the negotiations table to, you know, get, get the best deal they can for Canada um, and, and, you know, in a sense, stand up to the, the pressure the president's putting on, on us. But, we, you know, we do need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, this issue around applying tariffs on a national security basis 
is something he can do outside of the NAFTA process. Just before I get Jim Stanford in for his comment on this, let me do a quick follow-up with you, Craig. Uh, we well remember, uh, nearly 30 years ago, uh, Brian Mulroney walked away from the table. He had his negotiator, Simon Reisman, actually leave those free trade negotiations with the United States, and, and he believed in hindsight that that actually led the Americans to get more serious and eventually get to the finish line. Anybody talking that way this time? <clears throat> I don't know if they're talking this way, but, you know, this, this is a good point from a point of view of people outside the, the bargaining rooms to be mindful of. <clears throat> when the... Um, what you see in, the, in, in terms of the, the public discourse, the quotes and the statements, this is all political posturing and positioning, right? So, you know, almost like every trade deal comes down to the 11th hour. Every trade deal actually is darkest before it's signed. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if the, U, the U.S. or Canada storms away from the bargaining table before we actually reach a deal. So we need to be a little careful in terms of how we respond to the, the news we're getting in terms of how the negotiations are going. Okay, Jim, thanks for your patience. You want no, to no, I, I agree with Craig that it is about uh, positioning for bargaining, and it happens in any kind of bargaining process. You know, I've seen it a lot in labor management uh, negotiations. Uh, you could go to the flea market and negotiate over a used mm -hmm. coffee table, and if you go into that negotiation saying, I'm going to deal with you no matter what, Okay, you're going to get taken to the cleaners. So both sides have to be in a position to say, no, I'm not going to accept any deal. And it seems to me that's exactly what the Canadians have already said. We will sign a deal if it's good for Canada, but we aren't going to sign any deal. And I think that's uh, appropriate, especially given the economic reality underpinning it, which is the Americans do get at least as much benefit from the two-way trade relationship as Canada does. There's we should no put doubt a number on that. this. Six hundred and seventy-three billion dollars a year in trade between our two countries. There is so much at stake here. And that's not the whole of it either. That's the two-way trade in merchandise. Mm -hmm. But there's tens of billions of dollars of two-way trade in services. Correct. Where the Americans have the advantage. We have mm -hmm. a small surplus on goods trade, small relative to the overall flow. The Americans have a, a surplus on services trade. Then there's the foreign investment. The Americans take back $26 billion a year in net profits on their foreign investments here relative to what we take back on our investments uh, from America. So all of that together, they've got at least as much at stake here. And whether Trump is erratic or not, at the end of the day, I think that economic self-interest is going to mean something in the U.S. calculation. So, I mean, we have to be sure that we're not trying to convince ourselves of certain things. <laughs> the guy we have to convince is the guy in the White House. And, of course, it, it is in no sense the same that we have the same harm or we're, we're the same importance. We're, a third of our GDP comes essentially from exports to the United States. That is not true of the, uh, uh, of the, of the United States. Mm -hmm. We like to talk about a lot. The government's talking point about all these different states that have the largest destination of their exports is Canada. Most of it's under 10%. There, this is an asymmetric relationship. We are one-tenth the size. We will hurt more than they will hurt. I don't understand the argument, well, we can make them bleed a little bit too. They will bleed a lot less. Um, the other part we have to keep in mind here is when we say that it's 11th hour and negotiations always come down to the 11th hour, this is why I think we got ourselves into a little bit of difficulty with the Mexicans. The Mexicans the new, have a new president coming in who doesn't want to spend his first three years arguing about NAFTA. Hmm. And so, yes, we could sit there pushing this off, ragging the puck, whatever metaphor you like, but... The two of the parties, of the other dance parties, may have a sense that we already are at the 11th hour. So the question for Canada at that 11th hour is, are we going to actually give in on Chapter 19, something that doesn't work, in my estimation? It was useful in 87. Mm -hmm. Or are we going to fight about it to say we were fighting? Dairy, a lot of Canadians would benefit from cheaper dairy. I mean, are the holdout issues issues really worth holding out for, given the extent of the importance of this economic relationship? Culture. I'm not quite clear. That's a new one that's come up this week. I want to come back to both sure. these things, the dairy and culture. But, but in your view, where is the absolute bottom line? What's the one thing we should not give in on regardless? You know, in term, I, in term, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I, I don't think there's anything on the table now that we should hold out on. I mean, Chapter 19 to me is ridiculous to hold out on. I totally get why Mulroney walked away from the table on that in 87. Everybody loves to, to go back to that historical mm -hmm. example. But we walked away from it in 87 because we didn't have the WTO dispute settlement system Which that came into effect in 95. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of a silly point. I know people keep making not with all due respect to you, but the others who keep making it. Um, you know, the dairy part, I, I think it's pretty clear to most trade people what we have to do to get out of dairy. And that is pretty much make a concession along the lines of what we did in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiation. I, look, that's not going to hurt us too greatly. It will hurt a few dairy producers, but it's probably good for the Canadian economy generally. So I don't really see the issues... 
here's what I think. We're, are we trying to save the furniture or we're trying to save the house that's burning? I think we're trying with this round of NAFTA, with this particular interlocutor, to save some furniture. And, and I think uh, if you want to let the whole, you know, let everything go up in flames uh, at this point, this doesn't seem to make sense to me. Inu, let me get you on this. You know, there, there are great debates happening in Canada right now about how firmly the Canadian government ought to go to bat for cultural industries, the dairy industry. We have very special and specific rules on that to, to protect those two things. They are long legacy files uh, for any Canadian foreign minister. What's your view on how hard Canada ought to fight to keep those two things under those spe special considerations? <clears throat> well, I think uh, Canada really has shown that it can actually move on some of these issues. We've seen that as part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we saw that in the Canada-EU trade agreement. I think there has to be some flexibility. Uh, I think largely what we see from Minister Freeland and Prime Minister Trudeau has been a lot of negotiating bluster. And we've seen that on this side, too, in the United States. Uh, so I think they have to basically ramp up their rhetoric a little bit to show that they can have a win when they come back home. And that's the big issue here. So I think a lot of this can be resolved. It's just a matter of the both sides coming down and saying, what's that compromise number? There has to be a medium in between the figure that they can settle on uh, in both of these issues. Culture might be a difficult one. Uh, I think Canada has always been pretty adamant of keeping that exemption in. Uh, and maybe they can get that if they're willing to give up Chapter 19. And that's probably something that they should be willing to do at this point. Jim, should, uh, should Americans be allowed to buy CTV? Or global? <laughs> no, certainly not. Uh, so Steve, you want I, to keep those cultural absolutely. industry Absolutely. I think it's uh, essential to our, our identity and to how we function as a society and to explaining why we're different than America. So you'd go to the wall for those? Oh, sure. And we can go to the wall. We can absolutely put in place. Even on things like dairy, the Americans have got their own holy grails that they're not touching. I mean, if you want to get into agricultural protectionism, go to the United States and look at the whole litany of rules and limits and everything else that's there. And so there's a natural give and take where the two sides have to side up what's really important and where can they make some progress and at the end of the day if rationality if economic rationality prevails and of course that's an if then they'll make their trade-offs and uh, and and come to a deal so that should be possible here let me get Craig on this I haven't heard from you Craig on on how hard you think Canadian negotiators ought to go to the wall to protect uh, our supply management for our dairy industry and of course our Canadian cultural exemptions well, I think that what we've seen is that over time, ev almost every trade deal Canada engages in, we end up giving up, um, we end up allowing more foreign access to the, the Can Canadian supply management industries. So, you know, in, in, when we negotiated free trade, with, free trade with Europe, you know, one of the concessions we had to make was to allow more European dairy uh, access in Canada. Uh, under TPP, it was the same story. So I, I think we can tell where uh, where the global trade narrative lies in terms of, of supply management. I think ultimately over time, you know, I don't think the Canadian government's going to be prepared to, to give up supply management, but I think they're likely going to end up or at least consider giving greater foreign access and then addressing some of the, the, the impact that that has on the domestic producers in order to you know, recognize the fact that this is going to create you know, economic challenges for them. The cultural industry issue, I think, is is different, right? So I think from from an economic point of view, I I, I don't I, I don't see it being a big issue for the United States in terms of, of of access to the Canadian market. And at the same time, I think it's really a Canadian identity issue. And so, you know, as an economist, I tend to be very much in favor of free trade and open markets. Uh, but when it comes to culture, I think I think there is actually a legitimate argument. For why you know when you're when you're a relatively small country, that's basically the size of California. When you think of population and economy size, you know you you, you might want to protect your your cultural industries because it, it is part of the Canadian identity and the char Canadian character. It's how Canadian stories get told. It's how Canadian history is communicated. It's how Canadian news is communicated. So, okay, Craig, let know, me jump in. Important. Let me jump in. I got 20 seconds left, Mark. Can you wrap it up? Yeah, in 20? okay. I just okay. want to put a, a, a caution. I'm not so sure that there is actually, this culture business is actually an American demand. It wasn't in their negotiating priorities. It hasn't really figured in a lot of the public conversation around the agreement up until now. I have a feeling that this is being put on the table either to um, mask a Canadian uh, concessions that they'll make elsewhere 
or to strengthen the American bargaining position on things that they really want in intellectual property, like copyright term and take uh, notice and take down and biologics and pharma. So I'm a bit skeptical of what I see to be coming mostly from Canadian sources on culture. Well, one thing I can say is I think our viewers understand this all a lot better now, thanks to the four of you. Inu, we thank you for being there for us from the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Craig Alexander from the nation's capital, he with Deloitte Canada. Jim Stanford. Uh, we love it when he visits us. He mm -hmm. spends too much time down in Australia. Jim, we love having you back Glad up to here. Be back. And Mark Warner, the principal of Ma Law. He's a Canadian and American trade lawyer expert. Good to have all four of you on TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.